I'd like to welcome everyone to the fourth webinar of the 2019 Ignis season. Ignis is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, is to ignite your curiosity and to spark your intellect. This webinar series is brought to you by the Office of Educational Technology and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And um, your, co your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells, and then we have a special co-host, guest co-host today, um, Jess Thompson. She's also from SBCTC, so thanks for joining us today, Jess. All right, um, in case you haven't heard, today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and you can earn an SBCTC Accessibility Rockstar badge um, just for participating in this webinar. There's a little bit more you have to do, um, but you can earn one of those um, badges, either an Accessibility Fan Club, an Accessibility Groupie, an Accessibility Headliner, or an Accessibility Roadie badge, and help your college win $1,000 in captioning. And um, you can read more on about that on um, the Access Washington blog. And Jess is going to put um, that link for us into the chat. Looks like she's already done that. Um, Jess, do you want to say anything about the badges before we move on? Um, nope. Other than people can do multiple things, participate in multiple events, and receive multiple badges. So uh, if you're inspired after this Ignis session to do more, uh, then I encourage you to do that and just submit another entry to the survey. Yeah, and the college who has the most badges at the end of the day is going to win $1,000 in free captioning from SBCTC. So um, get in there and um, fill out Jess's um, little survey that goes with earning a badge, and um, you can help your college win some captioning. All right, so our topic today is creating inclusive PowerPoint presentations, and our presenters are um, Amy Rovner and Miranda Levy. I almost accidentally combined their names there. <laughs> A big thank you to both Amy and Miranda for joining us on Global Accessibility Awareness Day to discuss accessibility in PowerPoint and um, inclusion strategies um, for presentations. We have switched web conferencing tools again this year. Um, as you know, we've been in Blackboard, we've been in WebEx, this year we're in Zoom. So we are going to get started today with just a very brief overview of Zoom and a few other minor housekeeping items. And then I'm going to hand it off to Jess to officially introduce Amanda. Oops, see, I just put them together again. Amy and Miranda. Oh my goodness, I'm having quite the day, aren't I? Okay, so the first thing on our list to check is um, your audio. And if you haven't already done so, you may need to press the escape key to exit full screen view so that you can find the audio menu. And then if you're experiencing any audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, you can call in um, by phone at 1-669-900. 6833 and then you just enter our ID our meeting ID number which is 361 298 378 and um, then the pound sign and that will um, get you into audio with your phone so please feel free to do that if you're having um, any audio trouble today Um, please note that all of our webinars are live captioned and you can access those captions by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar and that runs um, horizontally across the bottom of your screen. And I have not been able to find a hotkey to activate those, um, so I believe you do need to navigate to the toolbar to find those. All right, um, we've got a couple of helpful Zoom links um, that um, you could possibly uh, want to explore. Um, the first one is to find the Zoom keyboard shortcuts, and we'll get all of these put into the chat for you as well. Um, the shortcuts are accessible at um, a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly. Uh, slash Zoom with a capital Z, shortcuts with a capital S, and then you may also find the Zoom Help Center helpful, and that is also a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash Zoom with a capital Z dash help with a capital H. 
Okay, so um, let's talk about our participants panel and the participants tools here real quick. Uh, the participants panel is located near the top right corner of your screen and the chat panel is located near the bottom right corner of your screen. But if you're not seeing them, um, just click on more in the Zoom toolbar or Zoom menu that's across the bottom of your screen and then you can enable those by clicking on participants or chat to add them into your view. Um, please type your comments and questions into uh, the Zoom group chat as we go, and please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when you're sending a message so that we can all see it. And um, the presenters have asked um, that we will um, get to the questions at the end. Um, we may answer a few questions uh, while they're presenting, um, but please do put all of your questions and comments into the chat, and we will get to those as soon as possible and definitely by the end of the presentation. Um, last thing here is if you would prefer to be in the full screen view, um, you can click on enter full screen um, to get into that full screen view and then if you want to get out of that you can just click on um, your escape key on your keyboard. Okay, so um, my slides are taking just a second to um, move for me. Um, Okay, so uh, you, you can find the participant tools in the participants panel that we were just talking about. Uh, you can raise your hand if you wanna ask a question and you just do that by clicking the hand icon um, in, in the panel. And then when it's your turn to speak, all you have to do is click on the microphone icon that is to the right of your name and you can click that to mute and unmute yourself. Um, we do ask you to please keep your mic muted when you're not speaking and that helps us cut down on interesting background noises that we sometimes hear. And then if you click on more in the participants tools, um, you can find some emoticons there and you can give applause or even a thumbs up there. All right, um, last thing before we introduce our presenters is um, to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and you can find the captioned recording link on the ATL blog along with um, the full IGNIS schedule and that's also a bit.ly link. It's bit.ly slash IGNIS, I-G-N-I-S, all in caps, 2019 dash recordings with a capital R. All right, I am going to, um, turn it over to Jess now to officially introduce Amy and Miranda. Take it away, Jess. Yeah, I'm really excited to introduce these two. Um, these are a couple of fabulous accessibility champions that we have in our system. Um, so let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Amy began teaching nutrition online for Shoreline Community College in 2010 and then was hired as Shoreline's e-learning faculty in residence in 2013. The following year, Shoreline hired her as an, as an instructional designer and in this new role, she quickly became aware of the need to provide accessible digital content for students. Amy firmly believes that all students, staff, faculty, and local communities should have full access to everything our excellent colleges offer. Some of Amy's achievements include starting a faculty learning community at Shoreline to explore and find solutions to challenges surrounding accessibility and assembling an accessible IT work group with members from across campus. It's no wonder that she's now Shoreline's accessible IT coordinator. Amy also represents the State Board eLearning Council um, on the SBCTC Committee for Accessible Technology Oversight. And despite many of her projects and busy schedule, Amy still manages to squeeze in teaching Nutrition 101 online about once a year. So Amy has a bachelor in hotel administration from Cornell and a master's in public health and nutrition from University of Washington. She's also a registered dietitian. And when not working, Amy loves to spend time with her family baking, camping, hiking, and just generally hanging out. So Miranda joined, joined Shoreline Community College as the Program Specialist for Student Accessibility Services in August 2018, after working as an Americans with Disabilities Act Specialist at the University of Washington for 10 years. She's worked and volunteered in the disability field for over a dozen years. Miranda has a bachelor's degree from Whitman College and a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from Western Washington University. She's also a certified rehabilitation counselor 
and certified ADA coordinator. When she's not working, Miranda enjoys reading and geocaching with her four-year-old daughter. So, welcome Amy and Miranda. All right, I went ahead and unshared my slides. So, um, Amy, go ahead and get your uh, slide deck pulled up. Okay. Uh, I that's, which one did I do? That one? Okay. Let's see. That looks good. Okay, we've got PowerPoint. We got PowerPoint launched. Yep. How's that? Yep. yep, you got it. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so um, you already know what we're talking about, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, I, we already mentioned briefly that um, today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, which we call GAD. Um, the purpose of GAD is to, let, to get everyone talking, thinking, and learning about digital access and inclusion and people with different disabilities. And I already broke our first guideline, which is to read the slide number at the beginning of every slide. So I should have said this is slide two. It's about Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And we are going to read the slide numbers when we remember. And we are also going to read all the text on every slide so that um, that's just another method of accessible presenting. So don't be surprised. All right. Uh, and Amy, I just, um, and Miranda, I just shared your file with everyone. Oh, thank you. Excellent. So you can follow along, anyone who wants to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Miranda. And what we're going to do is we're just going to switch off slides talking pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we're not going to say who's speaking every time. So you'll just get to know our voices. Um, so moving on to slide three, learning outcomes. Uh, at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to list at least three slide basics, uh, name two important things about text and font types, create appropriate alt text for images, and list at least three inclusive presenting tips and tricks. <laughs> slide four, this is our first poll question for the day. So we're curious who's in our virtual room today. Um, it helps us tailor our conversation a little bit. So your options are, oh, and Alyssa's launching the actual poll. So you should be able to click a choice. Um, the first choice is faculty. Second choice is student. Third choice is college staff or administrator. Fourth choice is librarian. And the last choice is other. So go ahead and click in who you are so we know. Give everyone a second to do that. All right, so you should be able to see the results. It looks like we've got 37% faculty, 3% student. Oh, I'm so glad there's students here. Thank you for joining us. 51% um, college staff or administrators. Yay. Um, no librarians. Well, that's too bad. Um, and 9% other. Um, so that's just helpful. Thank you so much. Um, cool. Thanks for playing our little poll. All right. All right. Moving on to slide five. Um, PowerPoint basics. <laughs> so that'll just introduce us to slide six, um, which is PowerPoint basics general. Um, so white space is important. Mm -hmm. um, and some of you actually in our uh, pre-webinar um, question answering alluded to this a little bit. Um, don't crowd the slide with too much text. Put your white space, right? Um, and be succinct. Not too much text, right? Um, and use minimal, if any, PowerPoint animations. Um, I am uh, not so much a fan of uh, animations. So for example, such as bouncing in, we just demonstrated this, or avoid flashing text or fast moving text. Uh, so if you, if you're able to see that you just notice those bouncing in and flashing text moving text those are examples of animation my recommendation is don't use either of those or any of those no animations unnecessary not accessible all right slide seven um powerpoint basics is about lists you want to make sure you use the true bulleted and numbered lists that are built into the PowerPoint system. Um, use built-in tools to create them. Those are usually on the um, 
navigation bar at the top. Um, and then just an example is like favorite ice cream flavors. Number one, chocolate, two, strawberry, three, vanilla. You want to click on, you know, highlight that text and click on the number tool instead of doing one period space chocolate, two period space strawberry. And that will make it more accessible for users. So Amy, yes, um, just to clarify, when you're saying true bulleted numbered list, can you be a little more specific about that? Uh, I mean, I think you said that when you were saying highlighting and numbering. Is that oh, what you're meaning? That is what I'm meaning. Yeah, so use yeah. the tools that are built into the show. You don't want to just type them in. That's what I mean yeah. by true. True. So true means use the PowerPoint tool. Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay. We can demonstrate that at the end, too, if someone wants to see it in action. Mm. All right. All right. Moving on to slide eight. More about PowerPoint basics. Descriptive hyperlinks. So a descriptive hyperlinks have meaningful text as the link rather than long, meaningless strings of letters. Um, so here's some examples. Um, and the next bullet, uh, our, our sub bullet here says, please watch this video. And it is a hyperlink. Um, I'm sure you've seen this in your Outlook emails and, and other PowerPoints, right? That is a hyperlink there. If you, if you were to click on that, it would take you to a YouTube video. The next uh, sub bullet says, please watch this video, colon, and then HTTPS uh, slash slash uh, Y-O-U-T-U dot B-E slash H-B-V-U-Z-K-R-L-J-Y-Q. <laughs> so it's just a very long URL, um, which is long and hard to read and difficult for screen readers or anybody. Um, so easier to just put that hyperlink into words that make sense. Okay, slide nine, um, PowerPoint basics, layout templates. Um, so layout templates define the read order of a slide and text boxes that might be skipped over by assisted tech and left out of the outline. Um, and so when you use a manual text box and you place it in there using some tools and in PowerPoint, it's not gonna be meaningful to a screen reader user. And so to do this and use the layout templates, you're going to go to the home ribbon and select the layout template. So here's the home ribbon and here's the layout choice, if you can see this. Select the layout template that best suits the slide content. So a title slide or a title and content is the one I seem to use the most or a section header we use pretty regularly. And um, read order kind of confuses people sometimes when I refer to that, but that simply means when a screen reader is reading a slide, it's going to read, hopefully, if you've done it right, the title first and down, you know, down the left side. And then if there's two columns, down the first column and down the second column. And that's what read order refers to. And as soon as you start placing images, placing text boxes and arrows <clears throat> outside of those tools, sometimes it'll read the arrows first and then some of the text and then the title. And so someone listening to the content with a screen reader is having a really hard time following where you're trying to go with your slide. So moving on to slide 10, PowerPoint basic slide titles. Um, an important thing to do, um, and you probably noticed us doing this on during this presentation already, is to give every slide a unique title. Like in this section, we've been talking about PowerPoint basics. So we're talking about this on every slide, but we're making the slides unique, um, or the, excuse me, the titles unique by saying like PowerPoint basics um, layout, PowerPoint basics slide titles. So that if a screen reader was reading this or anybody, um, they would know the difference between slide nine and slide 10, right? These are not the same slides, right? If they're looking just from the um, titles. Um, so, which brings me to my second bullet, repeated titles are confusing <laughs> because they are. Um, for example, PowerPoint basics, slide titles, and PowerPoint basics, slide numbers, um, PowerPoint basics two, and PowerPoint basics three. We could even do that if necessary. Okay, slide 11, um, PowerPoint basic slide numbers. As you notice, we've been calling out the numbers in advance. 
Um, this helps people follow along, whether it's someone who got distracted by a device and was checking email and is trying to catch up and figure out where we are, to someone who's actually navigating and needing to navigate independently. They know, okay, we're on slide 11. Um, and so uh, how to add these. Um, here's some quick instructions. Uh, if you click on insert in the ribbon at the top of your PowerPoint screen, select the header and footer icon, and then you can check slide number, and that should automatically add the slide numbers to your slide. Um, and as I said earlier, we can demo that at the end if someone wants to see it. Moving on to slide 12, um, PowerPoint basics using caption videos. So captions are required for all video content. I'm sure you all know this. Um, working in higher ed, most of you, I'm assuming. Um, so find and use already captioned content is obviously, um, you know, most helpful. Um, but that's not always going to be available, right? Um, or create your own. Uh, use a script. Scripts. There's no T there. It's missing. It's missing. Script, it. I think. Yes, that's yes. supposed to say script. So that's a slight typo, but that happens. So use a script. <laughs> <laughs> um, it quickly becomes synced uh, captions on YouTube. Um, for those of you who have used YouTube um, videos, uh, they do have auto captions, um, which uh, are editable and I would encourage you to edit them because they're not perfect. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and if you need assistance with um, getting your videos captioned, uh, including your YouTube videos, which as I said, do need editing, um, contact your IT or your e-learning departments or whomever does that for you on your campus. You know, for example, here at Shoreline, it would be your e-learning department, like Amy. Correct. Indeed. All right, uh, slide 13. Um, so we're moving on to text and font types, this section. So slide 14, text and font types, general guidelines. You wanna use a sans serif font. Um, and so examples of those are Calibri, Arial, and Franklin Gothic. And you don't wanna use a serif font like Times New Roman. And so if you can see um, on the Times New Roman, there's little, they're called serifs, but little things that stick out at the edge of the letters. Those make the letters blur together, so it's hard for some folks with um, disabilities like dyslexia to read them. And also the spacing between the letters changes, and that also makes it difficult for some people to read it. So stick with ones that don't have all those fancy curly cues hanging off the edges, and people will be able to read them more easily. Um, titles on your slides should be a minimum of size 44 point. So here's what 44 looks like. It's a good size. It's really easy to read. And your body text should never be smaller than 24 point. So it should be a minimum of 24 point. So start large. And again, you're not going to put that much text on your slides. So you're able to use larger fonts. And um, especially when you're projecting on a screen in a large lecture hall or auditorium, you really need it to be very large for people to be able to see it and read it easily. Moving on to slide 15, text and font types continued. Um, not the best, admittedly, uh, unique title, but <laughs> it'll do. Um, uh, use bold to emphasize your um, text. Uh, never underline, italicize, or use color change alone to emphasize your points. This is not the most accessible way to do that, but bold is an excellent way to do that. Um, use a high contrast ratio for font and background, uh, 4.5 to 1 for normal text and 3 to 1 for large text. Um, so uh, your normal text is like your body, uh, large text is your title if we're talking PowerPoints. Mm -hmm. um, we could be talking other things if we're talking about posters or other, other such things. Um, an example of poor contrast <laughs> is right here on your screen, which you might not even be able to see. It's in yellow. Um, yellow on a white background is um, not Good. I will just say I like that. Do not use it. <laughs> White and yellow are almost the same color, so not good. Um, 
which is why I say here example, poor contrast in case you can't read it. Uh, I can barely read it to be honest. Uh, there are free contrast checkers available um, and we can talk about that uh, mm -hmm. later on if you want some examples of those and we have resources at the end of this presentation. So. Yep, there's um, a link specifically to the web aim contrast checker on the resource page. There and, it is, yes. Yeah. Okay, slide 16, we're switching again. This is alternative text section. So slide 17, what is alternative text? Alternative text, which we also, in shorthand, we call alt text, is a description of an image. Um, this description allows those using screen reading software to know what images are on the slides, even if they're blind or have low vision. And so you want to be a little careful about the description because you want to make sure it meets the needs of your audience. Um, and then you can mark some images as decorative um, and there's a way to label them as decorative image. Um, we pretty much discourage that because um, if you start to think through when would you have an image that was only important to sighted users, why would you even share it if it was that if it's not important enough to add alt text, it probably shouldn't be in your presentation at all. Mm -hmm. um, and if it is important enough to warrant, you know, everyone needs to see it, everyone needs to get information out of it, then it absolutely needs to have alt text. Mm -hmm. So we say use decorative very, very sparingly. Yeah. People have different philosophies, but Amy and I are of the anti-decorative image uh, philosophy. <laughs> all right. All right, moving on to slide 18. Um, adding alt text on the PC, um, which is what we're using right now. Um, so, uh, step one, right click on the image. Um, and I think when I said PC there, I also meant to say PowerPoint, but yes. you know. Yep, we're doing PowerPoint. I'm just reading. Um, so, anyway, back to my steps. Um, step one, right click on the image. Uh, step two, click on uh, size and position, uh, which is what you will see when you right click. There'll be a menu of things. Uh, on the right hand format picture menu, click on the alt text drop down. And again, we can demo this later. Um, then step four, enter text in the description field. Uh, this will auto save so that you don't need to f look for a save button. Um, you can see this picture of this adorable young child <laughs> to the right. Um, there uh, is uh, alt text of her um, as required. So I just put that there as necessary. You want to put the, um, the arrow up so we can show the alt text? Um. It's not showing. It won't. I don't think it'll show right I now. promise there is alt text though. Yes. Um, and then I, this was how you do it on PC. The steps on a Mac are a little bit different um, when we can review those at the end. But I was excited to see my Mac has um, the 2018 version of PowerPoint. And um, when you go to add the alt text, there's no more title fields because so in the PC, you still really need to focus and make sure you don't put the description in the title field. You put it in the description field. In the Mac for 2018, there was only an edit alt text field. So that made me very happy. Um, so moving on. Um, so now I've clicked on the wrong thing. Here we go. Slide 19. Oh, poll question number two. Melissa will put the poll up for you. But it's a little test to make sure you're paying attention. What is the best alternative text for the image on this slide? Um, a, a Colgate ad. B, a family photo or C, a woman, a little girl, and a man. And if you can't see the photo, uh, it is a picture of um, a pretty cute family. <laughs> uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a lady, a really adorable little girl, and a really handsome young man, um, you know, out on a drive. There's no bias there. None. Yeah. None whatsoever. No, I'm just, it was a picture from, you know, Google. <laughs> We need the music from Jeopardy. Oh, look at that. Such smart attendees. 
so you can tell you're paying attention. All right, so 76% um, put a woman, a little girl, and a man. That would be the best description. 24% um, of you said family photo. I can see why you would be inclined to think that. But um, my advice to folks when they're working on their alt text is to close their eyes. And how would you want someone to describe that photo to you? Um, family photo works, except... I do want to mention, though, that uh, we did get a comment from uh, one of our uh, participants who said it depends on what you want to portray, which I think is an excellent point, um, point to make. Exactly right. Yes. Um, and that again comes back to context. Um, I often do an example of a picture of Mount Rainier and I ask people what they think they might use. Like, let's say you put that in your class and, you know, I teach nutrition. So if I put a picture of Mount Rainier in my class, it's probably not really related to the content. And so just, you know, a simple alt text of Mount Rainier is probably adequate. But if a colleague of mine who teaches geology puts a picture of Mount Rainier in her class, there's probably more context that she wants students to get out of it. So maybe it's the direction you're looking at it, or it's the snow field, or it's the height, or there's some other data that that picture is supposed to be informing those students about their topic. So um, that is, um, yeah, our thoughts on alt text. And it looks like We've got some other comments in the chat. So Jackie Hubbard said context is important, assigning gender if it's not a picture owned by the creator. Um, yeah, that's an interesting, that could be tricky. And I guess for gender, I think, again, you're the one applying the photo. So even if you assign someone a gender that maybe that's not their true gender, but that they identify with, it's the gender that you pick the picture out for like maybe this was a nuclear family picture or a traditional American family or something um, so yeah that's an interesting thing to think about um, and then Crystal hi Crystal she's like shoreline faculty um, a lot of our words have multiple meanings or relative meanings so it's best to be more literal or observatory truth truth and again think about your audience think about the message you're trying to convey All right, so next slide. Um, new section, accessibility checker. There's great news. Um, slide 21, using the accessibility checker. Microsoft products and PowerPoint included um, have accessibility checkers built into them. And these will alert you to issues such as missing alt text, slides with poor reading order, slides without titles, um, and um, it's pretty easy to use. To use the checker, you click on File in the ribbon at the top of your screen. Under Inspect Presentation, you click on the Check for Issues dropdown, and then select Check Accessibility. And you'll end up with a panel will open on the right-hand side, and it'll list the different kinds of issues that you have to repair, and it'll have usually helpful ideas on how to fix them, and with a little more context, too. So that, and we can show you that at the end as well. All right. All right, so moving on to slide 22, and we're gonna transition um, out of the technical aspects of um, PowerPoint, um, but um, into general inclusive presenting some tips and tricks. Uh, so let's move on to slide 23, tips and tricks set up. Um, so first, just ask before the presentation if participants would like your PowerPoint in an alternative format. So for example, um, if you are teaching a class um, uh, in which you're using a PowerPoint, um, whether it's an online class or an in-person class, or you know, you're, if you're an instructor or if you're just doing a, a one-time presentation, contact people ahead of time and ask them if they if they need the presentation in alternative format if they want it on paper or if um if they need it on their computer however uh, they need it uh, in braille or large print something like that if you're doing a webinar email the powerpoint in advance if that's possible for you like we did today two minutes before the presentation <laughs> um you know because that can be helpful for some people they can listen to it or they can enlarge it or something like that um, and share the slides in the chat. 
Um, okay. Sure, go for it. Um, moving on to slide 24, um, tips and tricks set up too. Um, request that participants raise their hand before speaking uh, and to speak one at a time. So again, this is more about um, when you're doing a presentation and you have your um, uh, participants being engaged in that discussion, um, you know, maybe your class. Um, for example, uh, Amy and I were doing a panel a couple days ago and we, we had a bunch of people um, in that classroom with us. Um, you know, I, I said, you know, let's make sure everybody raises their hand um, and so we're not talking over each other and um, that uh, everybody uses a microphone so that and projects so that everybody can hear. We have some people with low hearing and we had an interpreter in there so the interpreter can be sure to hear and make sure they're getting that information to the person who cannot hear. Um, if you're using a webinar or you're doing a webinar again, um, have a moderator to help manage the session. Um, uh, participants can use the raise hand feature and communicate that to them early. Um, and participants can type questions in the chat, of course, as an alternative method mm -hmm. um, of communicating. Um, moving on to slide 25. Okay, I'll, I'll go, okay. Um, slide 25, um, tips and tricks for presenting. Uh, so stay in the light, this isn't face to face, you wanna stay in the light and face the participants so that you can see their, your face at all times as much as possible. Um, I lip read a lot and so when someone is turning their back to me all the time, I miss a lot of the content. Um, be sure there's a light on the interpreter as well if you have one in your room, um, especially if you've darkened your room for a presentation. The person needing to view the interpreter has to be able to see them um, and their hands in order to stay um, involved in that conversation. For webinars, you want to make sure you light your face from the front um, and uh, capture your head and shoulder view. Again, um, if we weren't live captioning this, we would probably have our camera on so that you'd be able to see our faces and you could lip read if you needed to. Um, and you also wanna check your image clarity before you go live. Because sometimes you're not aware of a glare or you know the overhead lights, and if you get lit from the back, it really is hard to see someone's face. Okay, moving on to slide 26, tips and tricks tricks <laughs> speaking um, speak clearly and at a moderate pace um, it, this is especially important when interpreters or live captioners are present um, but good for everybody of course um, use a microphone when possible um, and again during a webinar um, presentation or distance um, presenting use a good quality microphone uh, test your microphone beforehand early on. Test your audio levels in advance, both for you and for um, speaking. And it's helpful to do a dry run of your session if possible. And Alyssa's really good at having us do that and you learn a lot from doing that, making sure you can be heard on the other end. Um, slide 27, tips and tricks, other one. So some other tips and tricks. Um, students who are hearing, in a face-to-face -face session, they can take notes while listening to a speaker. However, students who are deaf cannot because they need to focus their attention upon the interpreter. So when topics of importance are being discussed, an outline prepared in advance is very helpful for them. Um, and same for a webinar. Um, if you could share out notes or your PowerPoint slides in advance, that's excellent practice. Um, and then also share captioned versions of a recorded session after the webinar. So like Alyssa will do in about a week, we'll all um, have access to um, a captioned recorded version of this. So you can go back and review um, or someone who had an interpreter or maybe didn't keep up with the live captions can go back and watch a real time, you know, caption that's synced with what we're saying. Um, moving on to slide 28, tips and tricks other two. Uh, if you need to get the attention of a student who cannot hear when their back is turned, um, maybe they're doing group work or who knows, um, it is okay to lightly tap them on the shoulder. Um, remember that students who have no hearing may not hear fire alarms go off, so if there are not visual strobe smoke detectors in your space, 
be aware of who is in the class and who evacuates. Um, just sidebar, um, it is building code required to have strobe smoke detectors in your space. <laughs> so if they're not in there, then you may bring that up to somebody um, <laughs> and let them know that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Also with regard to tapping someone on the shoulder, um, that's fine, but also might have a discussion with the student about their comfort level because um, while they're, they may have a barrier with their hearing so that you want to tap them or something, that might not be their preference because they might have something else going on that makes them not comfortable with being tapped, you know, or being touched. So they might have another preference, like maybe you um, stomp on the floor so they feel a vibration or something like that. So you want to have a discussion with them. They know their body best. They know what's most comfortable for them. Okay. Slide 29, um, tips and tricks, other three. Um, for participants with low or no vision, describe any images or graphs that you share. So um, that, like um, Miranda did when we had the picture of her and her family um, for you to add alt text to, it's helpful to describe those images or graphs, um, particularly when you know someone with low vision is participating. Um, and that brings us back. I was reading the chat as well about how our words have multiple meanings and relative meanings, so it's good to be literal or observatory. I actually was inspired by the idea that, um, you know, if we labeled it family, it would be a really interesting exercise to then have everyone maybe craft a two sentence description of what family means to them. Because, you know, it may not, it may be fine if it was one mom, two moms, you know, two dads, four dads, whatever. Um, but maybe family encaptured the meaning and it didn't matter what the actual makeup of the family was. So it's intriguing. I love talking about alt text. There's innumerable ways to write it. Um, and here's our resource page. Um, we've got WebAIM, has a lot of information about PowerPoint accessibility. And this is slide 30. Darn it. Mm -hmm. um, Penn State has some great resources on accessibility and usability. Um, and then the web aim contrast checker is linked there and lots more information and tons of other um, activities for global accessibility awareness day all around the world happening today. And these are all hyperlinks as we mentioned before. Yes. So you can all click on these, these descriptive hyperlinks and these will take you to uh, the various web aim pages to Penn State and to the GAD site. Yes. All right, so slide 31, questions. Maybe Alyssa can chime in. I don't know if we caught them all. Yeah, so if we can look some of the questions over from the chat or if people want to add to the chat or if um, people now want to take the time to verbally ask us questions, if you're more comfortable with that. Uh, there was one question from N. Hopkins, and if you could go back to slide 10, the oh, question sure. was, were the examples at the bottom of how title, of how slides should be titled? So I think ideally the top, the best example is that PowerPoint basics and then slide titles is unique compared to PowerPoint and compared to PowerPoint basic slide numbers. I think that's a preferable way compared to PowerPoint Basics 2 and PowerPoint Basics 3, but at least those are still distinct and they have a, a flow order so people would know what order they would go in. But yeah, those are better than, I mean, certainly both of those are preferable to, the, to PowerPoint Basics by itself repeated four times. Definitely. And then um, we also had an interesting comment. Um, I think it was Mary Gerard put it in. It says M. Gerard, but I'm pretty sure it's Mary. Um, the comment is the technical term for the serif blobs is a ditzel. So that's a little interesting um, bit of trivia. <laughs> that the little serif blobs are called ditzels. Ditzels. Okay. I oh, that's fun to that. Keep that in mind. Yeah, we'll write that down. We, uh, for those who are at Shoreline, we're doing this presentation again in person in a couple of weeks. So we are going to add that little. Yeah, we are. That little yeah, that's a great trivia our presentation. That's a great trivia question. Um, I'm not seeing any other specific questions um, in the chat. Um, maybe a couple of comments. Uh, Crystal made a comment about image citations um, and she was asking, how do you handle alt text in image citations? 
And then um, Jerry Lewis, um, I'm not sure if it's a response to that or just a comment, said, I already would do continued. I think he's referring back mm -hmm. to the name of the slides, um, but making them unique is a great tip. So um, that I was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we go back and address uh, Crystal's comment about how do you handle alt text and image citations. Jess did put in the chat that for her, um, Jess says, I just try to only use public domain images so I don't have to attribute them at all. Um, she said that's her trick. <laughs> that is an excellent trick. Um, you, I do know that you want your alt text is separate from the image citation. So the alt text is really for that screen reader user so they can access the content of the image. Um, the image citations, if you do need to cite them, that needs to be visible to everyone. So that still should be under the image or above the image or, you know, referred to the image. Um, sometimes they're doing it at the bottom of the slide. Um, but you, you do want that to be available to all users, not just ones using screen readers. So mm -hmm. separate items, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like Ty says right there, a citation is good as a caption um, or in the notes or something like that. Um, you might do it like that, but um, yeah, oh. but but uh, but but the alt text is something that if you were to like hold your mouse over it then you would see that alt text. Yeah, often it hovers, not always. Yeah, but, not yeah. always, but yeah. it, it should. Yep, and then, um, and Hopkins said, how do you determine which images are public domain? And um, Jess replied, I use sources like Pixabay or Unsplash. Those are awesome places. Um, so I, can you still, can you filter, um, oh, what's it called? I'm blanking on the name, Flicker? you know the big, hmm? Is it Flickr you're looking for? Yeah, Flickr, thank you, is what I was yep. trying to come up with. I know you can search by Creative Commons, but then you still have to attribute. I don't know if there's public domain for those or not as a search so, option. So yeah, I mean, you're gonna wanna look, I mean, even some, like for example, Google searches by by usage rights, but, but it's not 100%, so uh, probably not even, 80%. So, you know, you have to look at the picture and if it's labeled public domain, then that, that gives you that information. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And Pixabay is pretty fun. It's really cute. You download the image and it says, Hey, you get to use this for free, but you know, someone created this, you want to donate, you know, a cup of coffee, you know, so it suggests that you donate a dollar or whatever for the image. Um, but those, they have a pretty good selection. Um, let's see. Oh, Wik Wikimedia. Oh, well, so that's a new one for me. I don't know that. Yeah, um, I kind of like Wikipedia, I guess, but it has a lot of images on it. I've just randomly stumbled on it. If you use CC search, um, okay. you can choose from all these different places. And I, I believe Wikimedia is one of the ones that was in there, but I might have accidentally stumbled upon that somewhere else. So I think Wikimedia, basically it's a part of, of, of Wikipedia and that's, that's where all their images are. And they typically have usage, I mean, they have usage rights, um, a, a usage rights field. So, you know, what, what kind of uh, licensing the image has and they all uh, pretty much all have some sort of uh, creative commons but you know it, it does vary from picture to picture so again you have to look at the picture and see what what they want if they want to be at, uh, have attribution or whatever Got it. cool hey since um, we're kind of finished up in a timely manner not that we have to stop taking questions but I wondered if maybe you wanted to do a quick demo of the accessibility checker or showing those true bulleted lists that we talked about earlier absolutely let's do it let me I mean this. obviously whatever the two of you would like to do but I think um, yeah that might yeah. be a good place to go people can continue to ask questions um, and make sure. comments so okay um, so why don't we start with the checker since that's the most global and helpful thing to do. So here we are, I think you can probably see the slideshow is now out of presentation mode. Um, if we go up to file in the upper left here, and then go over here to inspect presentation, check for issues, click on that, and go down to check accessibility, click on that, 
It's going to take a quick assessment and thanks to the teamwork of this group today, um, there's almost no, <laughs> no accessibility issues. Um, the only thing that's left is this content placeholder four on slide eight. And if we go to there, it takes us to slide eight. And what it doesn't like is this ugly example of bad hyperlinking. So which is there on purpose. It's there on purpose. Right? <laughs> so it caught it. Um, but what's really nice and I, what I think is really helpful is down here below the box of issues are additional information. So why to fix it and it explains why and then it tells you how to fix with the steps um, and it keeps going. So it's just a handy um, quick and dirty thing to do. Um, it, I don't think it catches things like slide numbers. I don't think it's a requirement in that if you don't have slide numbers. Um, those are really essential. It does not, I mean, and note that it doesn't catch everything. Like it, it didn't catch that yellow on white, that yellow, oh, right. that yellow font on white background. It's, awesome. It didn't catch um, those um, animations that are really not that appropriate. Um, so, so it's, it's a good checker, but it's not a hundred percent. So, so really, this presentation is really important for you to pay attention to, because <laughs> it's better than the checker. If we say so ourselves. Yes, if we say so. I'm just gonna pat myself on the back, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. I think another really important thing is that using these layout templates, like Jess reminded us today. Um, so when you're using a PowerPoint, you go up here. You're on the home screen. You wanted to maybe edit the slide. Um, or change the layout and I'm going to ruin the slide if I do it But if you go up here to the layout and you click here are all these options and so they still have our theme Our lovely green and yellow shoreline theme, but mm -hmm. we can choose a different style And then these are all going to be ordered properly labeled properly. So for the best screen reader use um, versus me going to insert taking a shape and deciding I'm gonna add this big fat arrow and I'm gonna paste this in here um, like that, that now needs alt text. It now needs to make sure it's in the right reading order. And um, it just makes a lot more work on your end. So it's smart to use the built-in tools because it makes it easier. And we all like, you know, we all have too much work to do. So yeah. let's get rid of that ugly arrow. Um, what else did we say we would demo? Um, I think slide the, number. Lists, the list. Oh, the list. Sure yeah, thing. the true bulleted lists and numbered sure. lists maybe might be a good one. Yeah, let's go. I don't know where it is. We could just make a new slide. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's just pop a new slide in here. New slide. All right. So, I mean, again, this is the standard stock layout. So it's already got a bullet in there. But let's say I wanted to make this a list of, um, I don't know, ice cream. Ice cream seems to be on my mind. All right. So <laughs> strawberry. Oops. Can't spot. I only show how we start the list. Oh, well, that one is just kind of already there, so we yeah, can just stop. but I'm going to show how to, let's make it a numbered list, right? So you just highlight it, and then you use these tools up here, and I can just click on the numbers, and now it's numbered. And so you know it's a true, that's officially true. Um, you could delete all of this, and you could just start typing dog, cat, and then you're like, whoopsies, I need to make this a bulleted list. Same thing, you'd select it, go up to these tools up here, which are in the home menu, and then click, and now you have a true bulleted list. So I wouldn't make it a numbered list unless the numbering was important. It's a, it's a context thing. You're so. absolutely right, Jerry. Um, like, uh, you know, when you're doing your presentation, you're doing your PowerPoint, probably your points are often going to be bulleted and those would be true bulleted lists. You would be, and you'd be using your, your true bullets from the PowerPoint. But yeah, you're not usually going to be using the numbers unless like we're doing the poll or we're saying step one, two, three. Um, or something like that, like we were demonstrating in some of our slides here. Yep. Yeah, but but I think our point here was that don't like type yeah, one don't. period yeah. space, yeah. you know, something like that. Oftentimes in Microsoft programs, it'll turn into a true bulleted list, but no guarantees. I wonder if the accessibility will 
catch it. Yeah, see here, it, oh, yeah. here it'll do it automatically. Yep. It was smarter than I was. So. But not all programs will do that. Like PowerPoint, pretty good about it, but not all programs will. Yeah. And then maybe you could also show us the alt text fields that you were talking about earlier, where the title and the description and where we're supposed to put. Yeah. So let's the alt add, text. We can go yeah. back to Miranda's lovely daughter. She was so let's cute. Add, yeah. Oh, here. Let's look at the pretty daughter. Oh, look at the pretty. Oh, I just added my own old. Oh, but look at that adorable. Oh, oh, what a cutie. My old kid. Um, I mean, that's an old old picture of him. But if we go to layout and just do yeah, title only. Um, and then so this picture. See how so if I click off of it, if I click on it, and you get the little white dots. Now I can right click on it. And I can go to size and position, and this will follow those instructions that we had written out. Um, and then alt text. So let me close accessibility. So when I did size and position, this format picture option opened up. And I'm going to go down to alt text. And we ignore the title box, and we just write in the description, boy with huge backpack. <laughs> <laughs> Was he going camping? I think he was. Yeah, he was probably going to YMCA camp or something. Um, and then you just click off of it, it auto saves. And so, um, yeah. And then if you just X out a format picture, it would like, like Amy said, it would auto save. So then it would be there for when you start your presentation. Mm -hmm. One thing I would say about the alt text field is there's no spell check in there. So you have to be really careful what you type. Mm -hmm. And I'm a terrible typist. So I have to go back and read all of mine just to make sure that I haven't made any mistakes. And that's a good point. Another thing is you never want to put um, the, like the, file name, like you never want it to be jackbackpack.jpg. That's bad alt text. Um, and you never want, I've seen people actually put like the link to um, the Creative Commons or that you never want to put links or anything in alt text. It literally should just be describing the image. Oh, and see, look how smart it is. So the accessibility checker, I took the alt text off of that image and now it says missing alt text. And so what's nice is we could be anywhere in this presentation and click on um, missing alt text and it's going to take you right to that page. So there's, there's also some great example or explanation at the bottom there to tell you why you should fix the things that it oh, identifies. Okay. Yeah, it has the same steps basically on yep. why on fix it. and then how yeah. to fix. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So they try and make it as easy as possible. But um, yeah. And I guess my last kind of suggestion I have is I know sometimes this feels overwhelming to people and it's so many things to remember, but um, I think once you start the practice of doing these steps, you know, using the built-in layouts, oh, I added an image, let me add the alt text. Once you kind of get that into your workflow, it goes pretty quickly. It's much easier to do it as you go than, oh, wow, I have a 42 slide presentation and now I have 22 images I need to add alt text. That's really overwhelming. So I think my piece of advice is really just to do it as you go, build it into your workflow. You know, like any good practice, you just have to practice it. Good habits, um, but it's worthwhile. It really is. Yeah, it really is. And it's just it, it, when it becomes like this is part of my presentation making, then it's it just becomes part of the job. So it looks like we might run over just a minute or two. Um, I want to get to this last question that Kathleen um, put into the chat, and then I'll close us out. So if you can stay sure. for a couple minutes, um, great. If not, um, thanks for joining us today, and go grab that recording in about a week or so. Um, Kathleen says, did you go over the arrange reading order? And also, if faculty insisted on using shapes, can you add the alt text for the screen reader to ignore? All right, so that's two questions. So yep, we didn't actually show so the you can do part. those quick and then I'll close okay, us out. You can do them quick. Okay, so here I am on the, well, let me find a different, let's find the slide. And we're on the home menu and you go over to arrange. This is one of those Microsoft things that to me doesn't make any sense. So I just go on faith. So arrange to selection pane. She did not even ask the picture of Wayne because that has like a whole bunch of stuff. Which one? The one with the pole, like that one, like with the picture with me. Oh, okay. All right. We'll do it on this one. Okay. So home and then arrange and then you choose selection pane. Oops. Now I turned it off. Um, 
Okay, and so it's bizarre. So it starts at the bottom. So, you know, because that makes sense. Um, you start at the bottom, and so when you click on the thing on the bottom, that's telling you what's going to be read first. So there's the first thing is the title. That's helpful. The next thing is the question. That works for our uses. The next thing is the image. And the last thing is the page number. So that works. Um, but let's say we, you know, you can rearrange them, you can click and drag, we could make the title be the last thing. And then that, that's not good. And so as you check the reading order, well, red paid, you know, slide 21st, maybe you want it to do that. But then you've got the content, and then the title, that's not going to be helpful if someone's listening to that. So this is how you can rearrange it. Um, using these little arrows or clicking and dragging. Um, and then the shape question, I, that comes back to the alt text discussion, right? Like if you're using shapes, why are they using the shapes? If they're using the shapes and they have a purpose because it's geometry, well, they need alt text because that is a meaningful piece of information that an unsighted user wouldn't um, have access to. So, um, yeah, or if it's like you're using a template, for example, that has a bunch of squares in it um, that is required by um, maybe, I don't know, somebody that gave you the template and said, uh, this has a bunch of squares, um, then I would say, yes, you're required to alt text it because there's like five or seven squares on your slide. It seems weird because they're unnecessary, they have nothing to do with geometry, but it is your institution's required template. So that would be something. Hmm. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, yes. And everyone's saying thank you and goodbye in the chat. Thank you everybody for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. And um, look for the recording if you'd like to, or if you go to, you know, if you work here and want to join us for a longer version of in person, feel free. And I'll just, I put your contact information into um, the chat and then I'm just going to hit a couple slides to um, close us out so we can introduce um, our topic for next week. And let me just get in here. Okay, uh, let's go from the current slide here. And I just want to remind everybody to go earn their badge. And um, there's just a little quick form you fill out and you get there from um, by visiting the Access Washington blog. And just kindly set up all those awesome looking um, badges for us to earn. I can't wait. Um, our presenters are going to earn a badge today for being headliners. And I think I'm going to end up being a roadie because I was a, a moderator. So I'm um, looking forward to doing that. And then if you'll join us again um, next Thursday, that'll be May 23rd, we are going to be talking about late work. So we've got wrestling, the ongoing dilemma of late work, and that will be uh, presented by Ellen Bremen from Highline College. So look forward to that. And I do uh, thank everyone for joining us today. And um, here's some contact information for myself and Jess. And I put our presenters' emails into the chat for everyone. So um, please feel free to continue the conversation and ask us questions and contact us if you need any further information. Thank you to our presenters for joining us today. Ladies, that was fantastic. Um, Jess, thank you for agreeing to be the special guest co-host this afternoon. And thank you to everyone in the audience who um, participated with us today. So thanks, everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. And then um, feel free to ask any additional questions you may have or 